Hello and welcome to this uh, third technical session of the GCF Private Investment for Climate Conference uh, titled Catalyzing Market Mechanisms, Carbon Pricing as a Tool to Finance the Green and Just Recovery. Uh, my name is Andreas Lunding and I'm Head of Climate Markets within the Private Sector Facility at GCF and I have the honor of being the moderator for this session. Uh, a couple of practical points uh, before we start with the program. Live remote interpretation to Spanish and French is available during this session. Please follow the instructions in the description of the session. To access the interpretation functionality, please open the Zoom application as a standalone window and select the language in which you would like to follow the session by clicking on the interpretation button at the bottom of the Zoom window. Automated live captioning is available with translation in several languages. Participants are invited to click the link in the session description. This will open a separate window where you can select the language for captions. Please note that this is an automated service and we apologize in advance if any of the language would be displayed incorrectly. We invite you to submit your written questions or comments related to the session in the Q&A field of the Hoover window. Please submit your questions in writing and we will pick these up as we go along uh, and then tackle them in the Q&A session at the end uh, after the panel session. Uh, we'll now proceed with the program. So firstly, I wanted to provide some introductory remarks to briefly set the scene for the discussion to follow. This year represents a, a potential pivot point for climate action. Countries are preparing to ramp up their emission reduction pledges under the Paris Agreement, with a significant number of these working towards achieving net zero emissions by 2050 as part of the Climate Ambitious Alliance. In this context, carbon pricing instruments, whether in the form of carbon trade frameworks or carbon taxes, can offer tools at scale in energy and resource efficiency, electricity generation for renewables, low carbon transportation, and the preservation of natural capital. As an illustration of this potential, recent analysis by IETA has shown that cooperation through market-based mechanisms under Article 6 of the Paris Agreement could reduce potentially the cost of implementing NDCs by about half, equivalent to savings of US 250 billion in 2030, and reduce global GST emissions by an additional 50% compared to countries acting alone. Notably, there is an underlying momentum for the use of such tools. Uh, in its 2020 edition of the State and Trends of Carbon Pricing report, the World Bank noted that the use of carbon pricing market mechanisms and initiatives, either in place or scheduled for implementation, expanded further in 2019 to a total of 61, evenly split between ETS schemes and carbon tax arrangements. These cover 12 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent, or about 22% of global greenhouse gas emissions thereby underscoring the potential for further expansion in the application of such initiatives. At the same time, the economic crisis triggered by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic may challenge the scaling up of climate action, including in relation to carbon markets. As we look towards a recovery in the global economy and with the green stimulus packages being introduced by governments, around the world to help economies respond to the current crisis. Careful implementation of carbon pricing initiatives could offer an opportune and effective approach to support a green and just recovery in many developing countries. So with this in mind, this session will focus on the prospects for further scaling up climate action, including through the private sector, in carbon markets and carbon pricing instruments, particularly in the context of COVID-19, and also looking ahead to important discussions on this matter at next year's COP26. Um, in this session, we will cover considerations on how to construct an efficient and fair carbon market, how to use this to ensure underserved areas of climate finance are also covered, as well as the interplay between voluntary and compliance-based carbon markets. Finally, we will bring these strands of thought together to consider innovative ways in which the GCF might be able to provide risk mitigation instruments to grow investor interest in scaling up carbon pricing initiatives and market-based mechanisms to speed up the climate resilient economic recovery and a longer term transition to low carbon development pathways. Before proceeding to the moderated panel session, I have the distinct honor of presenting the panelists for this session. On the panel, we have first Renat Heuberger, who is CEO of South Pole. Uh, we have Margaret Ann Splorn, who 
who is executive director of the Climate Markets and Investment Association, and also concurrently an active private sector observer to the GCF board, representing the developed nations constituency. We have Jan Willem van der Ven, who is head of climate finance and climate markets at EBRD. And finally, we have Scobie Mackay, managing director within the commodities and global markets business at Macquarie. So with that, I'll open with the first question uh, for the panel. Um, and this relates to COVID-19 and carbon markets and whether this is, uh, we're seeing a crisis or an opportunity. Um, let us start by contextualizing the topic in terms of the, the current situation. Whilst as mentioned in the introductory remarks, there's continued underlying momentum towards an expansion in the use of carbon pricing tools to support climate action. At the same time, the COVID-19 crisis has arguably caused some disruption to this dynamic. As an example, negotiations around Article 6 of the Paris Agreement that were meant to have been finalized at COP26 in Glasgow at the end of this year have now been delayed by a year. At the same time, the market reduction in international commercial aviation activity over the past few months will also have a likely impact on the initial operational phase of the Corsia offset framework. So if I can put to you, Renat, what is your sentiment around the near-term prospects for further scaling up carbon pricing mechanisms for climate action? What are some of the opportunities as well as potential pitfalls coming out of the current situation. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Andreas. And uh, first of all, thanks a lot for having me. Um, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. I think this question of uh, climate action, car markets and COVID is really a very interesting one. And Andreas, I think you have already mentioned one key point, which is that very obviously, COVID simply creates a lot of uncertainty in anything. Nobody really knows how economies will recover, will, what kind of recovery we have, how long it's gonna take, when a vaccination is coming through and so on. And of course, uncertainty is the last thing investors want when they talk about long-term commitments. And we all know the transformation we have to achieve soon, in this decade still, this is a long-term strategic repositioning of assets. And so COVID certainly in this sense does not help at all by creating all these uncertainties. Um, however, there is a couple of other elements I would like to highlight here. One is that uh, an element we realize at, in our work at South Pole when we work with corporates we observe that across the corporate world, there is a renewed interest generally in the topic of risk and resilience. It has become clear that if you are not resilient to COVID, you have a problem pretty soon. And um, people are making this connection now very clearly between COVID as a global health crisis and climate change as a global environmental crisis. So across the world, we observe co uh, company boards being much more attentive when it comes to long-term um, uh, risks and the question, how can a company be positioned in a more resilient way? So in this sense, COVID, I think, did have uh, an impact on boards in taking this topic much, much more serious. Another interesting element I observe is in COVID-19, you had this or you still have this debate of people who deny science. People who say wearing masks doesn't make sense, COVID doesn't exist, it's an invention, you know all these arguments. And we have had these arguments in climate change before. People were denying science, it doesn't happen, it's not man-made, all that. But now with COVID, you see what happens if you deny science. It's going to spinning out of control. So I think COVID is a big reminder that it's simply not a very good idea to just ignore science and do the opposite. And we do believe very strongly that that has an impact on, on the climate debate as well. It is simply not a good idea to deny the reality on climate any longer, as it was a bad idea for COVID. 
Another uh, point I would like to make, and also Andres, you, you hinted at this before, and I'm sure we discussed this later on this panel, is this entire idea of build back better. COVID has devastated our economies. And globally, we see billions, if not trillions of dollars being pledged by governments in COVID recovery. When, if not now, is there a better moment to attach strings to this financing? And like the Canadian government has done and said, if you want to benefit from COVID relief packages, you have to be basically observing the TCFC guidances. So these are first hints where governments make the connection. And I do believe that it's a unique opportunity right now we have to build back better and to ensure that the COVID rescue packages are done in a way that at the same time we are embarking on a low uh, carbon uh, economy. And perhaps my last point quickly on this one is um, another lesson from COVID. If what, what COVID has shown is what happens if you radically do measures like cutting 100% of the flights, shutting down 100% of the restaurants, locking out 100% of the population. This has devastating impacts on the economy. Carbon markets are working differently. They put out price signals. So in case of carbon markets, there is no shutting down of 100% of air traffic, but we will increase pricing so that hopefully all the 60, 70% of useless flights are gone, but we keep the 30% important flights. And we will observe that for, near, for, for uh, we will achieve nearly the same impact in terms of carbon reduction, which much less economic costs. So for me, and this is my last point, COVID also shows that markets, price signals, achieve nearly the same impact and radically cutting everything with a fraction of the economic cost, if not a benefit. Because believe me, 50% of our flights, all of us here, were probably a little bit useless. We could have done without them. But the other flights would have been important. That's what car markets do. So in this sense, I hope that COVID, as much uncertainty creates, enlightens our thinking on how to tackle the climate, climate crisis as well. Thank you very much, Renat, for, the, for those very, uh, very thoughtful observations. And, and certainly, Build Back Better is, is, is a very central theme, or a theme that should be central to all of these discussions. Uh, and the, the aspect of conditional financing in, in rescue packages is absolutely crucial. So thank you for making that point. Um, if I could uh, um, next turn to, um, to Jan Billem and, and to, to talk a little bit about COP26 as we look ahead. As I mentioned, that's been delayed by a year. So there's a lot of expectations placed on the outcome of COP26. Um, it's, and it's seen by some as a, sort of the last chance to forge the rules of a functioning global carbon market that can help countries deliver commitments sent under the Paris Agreement. Um, an indication of the emphasis on carbon markets leading up to COP26 is the recent establishment of the, on the task force of scaling voluntary carbon markets, launched by Mark Carney, UN Special Envoy for Climate Action, and finance advisor to the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson for COP26 with a member base spanning more than 40 leaders from across the global carbon market value chain. So Jan Willem, would you agree with this sentiment in relation to the importance of COP26 and what, what do you see as the critical outcomes to be achieved at COP26? And specifically, how can pri the private sector work to deliver results on market-based mechanisms, including through voluntary markets that can translate into more ambitious climate action over the coming decade? Thank you, Jan Willem. Thank you, Andreas, uh, for this introduction. Um, let's say I, I'm, I'm optimistic, and in fact, I'm very pleased that, to see that I um, that on the theme of markets, there's a lot of new energy at the moment uh, going into this uh, development across the globe. Um, let's say we see, for example, that under the EU emissions trading scheme. Um, the, the scheme is further developing, it's firming up, and uh, there's a discussion now of uh, extending it uh, to other sectors as well. So that is, uh, I think, a good, uh, a good development. And as you said, the, uh, I'm also very pleased to see that there's private sector um, initiative 
uh, like the task force on scaling co one three carbon markets. Um, I think these are all good good signs in the in the, in the run up to the to the COP twenty six. Um, so, in my view, the carbon markets play a, a key role, a vital role in scaling up climate action and particularly leveraging the private sector. And yeah, the question is why? Um, because markets, they deliver cost efficiency, they can be deployed uh, at scale and, and often when they work well and well designed, they can lead to quick results. So it, in my view, we all know the history of the EU emissions training scheme where prices have gone up uh, to 30, then went down over time to three, and now they're back uh, at, uh, at the, in the higher numbers. Um, I think what it showed is that uh, if a, if an emission reduction target is set, uh, the market will do its best to meet that target in the most cost efficient manner. And I think cost efficiency, particularly now in the COVID situation, is a key theme. Yeah, the, the fiscal resources uh, are the declining and uh, we need to make maximum use uh, of the funds that uh, are going around. Um, let's say in the EWTS, uh, it took a bit long uh, for the kind of the targets to be upped, which I think would be also the evidence that markets can lead to, um, uh, markets uh, uh, relate to cost efficiency of meeting a target, but if the prices go down, then maybe we can accelerate faster the uptake of more stringent targets. Um, and that would be very much aligned uh, with uh, what we aim to do under the Paris Agreement. Um, as you said, uh, with, with, uh, um, with the World Bank, AITA and University of Maryland and Climate Focus, we, uh, we have looked into these uh, cost efficiencies and we also looked into what it would mean for the EBRD region um, if there would be uh, full global trading happening. And if it would uh, happen, then it would lead to, and that's only the EBRD region, uh, savings of, uh, let's say, north of 50 billion a year by 2050 and over 130 billion by, by the end of the century. I, and that's based on current ambition, and of course, uh, uh, current ambitions uh, do not lead to the less than two degrees. So I would expect the numbers to be even higher if if there's more more ambition. Um, now, at the moment, there is no global market, unfortunately, and that uh, has shown to be difficult to realize. Although I think Corsia. Um, offers perspectives in, in relation to a global market, at least for the aviation sector. But I think all of this shows that if there's a systematic measure as carbon market uh, implemented, then these savings, they can be redeployed, um, create fiscal space, for example, to, uh, to deal with the issues like just transition but also uh, it could lead to, uh, again, accelerating our actions toward, uh, towards net zero. Um, so I think I, I want to, before going to the COP um, issue, I want to underline that in my view, markets are very good at informing clients as to what matters uh, on the climate side. Uh, it, uh, it really puts a price on carbon and that helps to kind of steer operational behavior as well as investments. And then, in my view, markets, if well designed, are also more rigorous. And the, the market disciplines itself. Um, and that, uh, I think, is quite important because there's a lot of attention to MRV and accounting, etc. And I think markets here uh, can, can help out. And then, last but not least, I, and that's very important. Markets um, foster entrepreneurship. They allow for ideas that people haven't thought about. And, they, and that's because markets need relationships, business relationships with parties. 
And, and again, that fosters in innovation and uptake of entrepreneurship towards the green economy. Therefore, in our work or with countries on long-term strategies and the NDCs, we, we pay increasingly attention to the inclusion of the market mechanisms in, the, in that work. And um, as an example, we recently published uh, a report on carbon market options in the Mediterranean region. Um, which was uh, drafted uh, by, by Southpol. So thank you, Renat, for, for the report. Um, then as to COP26, yes, it's very important um, that the rules will be approved. I think, let's say the key one is of course to ensure the rules will ensure that there's no double counting uh, of the same uh, carbon credit. So it can only be used once. Um, and uh, yeah, it's about ensuring that uh, at a high level that the MRV and accounting rules are well established and, uh, and also how we track such transactions uh, throughout uh, kind of a defragmented uh, uh, world. I don't think that everything can be agreed in the COP. I think there will be a decision uh, to kind of delegate issues down to uh, let's say other institutions or uh, probably needs more fine tuning, maybe no, new methodologies that need to be developed. But uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I hope that uh, a conclusion can be uh, coming. If not, uh, if there's no decision, then I think, yeah, there's a key role then for the private sector to undertake some of these roles, um, as well as uh, kind of more in the regulatory sphere in order to mobilize itself. Uh, we see a lot of uh, net zero pledges from companies. Um, markets will play an important role in, in meeting those uh, those targets. Um, so I, yeah, and, uh, as a last point together with the MDBs, uh, we have set up a work group on article six that is uh, generating uh, knowledge pieces, thought pieces, uh, to help to kind of uh, yeah, create an environment that, in which uh, we can uh, see uh, article, article 6 driving uh, once further uh, approved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan Willem, and, uh, and I hope people generally share that, that sense of optimism about the prospects for an outcome in, in a year's time. And I, I particularly, in your answer, picked up on uh, on the characteristics of cost efficiency and scalability of, of carbon markets in, in a fiscally constrained post-COVID-19 world as being important. Um, uh, and also the, the, the rigor and discipline that markets bring and, and price discovery, uh, which are also important aspects. Um, turning next to how to actually sort of construct and build an efficient and, and fair carbon market system. Um, previously introduced carbon pricing mechanisms, um, such as the CDM or the EUETS, although significant in scale, have also attracted some degree of criticism. For instance, uh, around lack of additionality, as well as high levels of market price volatility. Um, if I can turn to you again, Renard, uh, building on, on some of these experiences, what are, from your perspective, some of the fundamental structural design parameters that need particular emphasis and attention to allow a further scaling up of high impact carbon pricing <clears> mechanisms <throat> that are characterized also by high levels of implementability, efficiency, as well as equity and integrity. Thank you, Rina. Thanks a lot for, for, for this question. And perhaps, um, you know, full transparency, my company Southpool has been uh, and is still a player in this market. So of course, um, my views are also the views of a, a participant in this market. We, we have been uh, an early developer of CDM projects and are now, um, uh, of course, heavily involved also in voluntary market projects. And let me start by saying that, of course, these markets that we are talking about are, of course, not perfect. We have undergone a lot of learning. There have been mistakes in the past. We have had a couple of really bad projects in the past. But I'm also proud to say, and uh, I would be also interested to debate this perhaps more uh, on this panel, 
I think we actually have come a long way since the 10 years where these markets are existing. We have learned a lot of lessons and, we, uh, uh, and still more changes that are based on the experience from the past can be now implemented in the next phase that Jan Willem just introduced that hopefully we can agree uh, at the COP next year in Glasgow. I think I, it's also time perhaps to clarify one big misunderstanding which is, um, there has been criticism about additionality and so on, but frankly speaking, I will challenge all of you here on the panel and everybody who's listening right now, please find me one mechanism in the world which has a more robust impact quantification, more robust than the carbon markets. I would like to hear if anybody is aware of anything. In my view, the, what we achieved with the CDM is probably the most transparent and most robust impact framework that ever has been created in the world. And I think a lot of people are not aware of that. I'm talking about tens of thousands of pages of approved methodologies by the UN system, detailed calculation methodologies, which force you as a developer to show you exactly how many tons of CO2 have you reduced with the project. I'm talking about an additionality tool, which actually you have to apply and get approved ex ante, showing in each and every project, proving that without carb finance, this project would not have happened. I ask where else in the world do you see that? If, if you're, let's say, um, government aid, for example, or, or NGO uh, donations, I'm quite sure nobody achieves the levels of robustness that we have. I would even say the fact that, and, and keep in mind, you can sit on your couch right today and go to cdm.unfccc.int and browse to thousands of projects, including all documents. There's full transparency and anything. I even believe that because it is so transparent, it attracts criticism because for the first time, people can actually see everything. And if out of 1000 projects, you find one which you don't like, you think that the whole system is flawed. So what I'm trying to say here is, I'm, I'm not kind of, diff I'm completely uh, clear, the market has to improve, but I also believe we are starting at a very good level. And I'm saying this also in hindsight of uh, the Glasgow COP next year, I would be, it would be really sad if we completely reinvented the wheel and did not base our framework uh, on the experience and on the methodological system we have already achieved in the past. Perhaps three short points on what I find important also going forward. One is one ton must be one ton. The good thing about CDM, gold standard, VERA, and all the current standards is that the calculation methodologies as to how to calculate one ton are always the same. And I think that's very important. If Germany calculates a ton differently than the US or China, these markets will never be fungible. Um, a second big point, and I think that's one of the big misunderstandings as well. It's, it has to be clear that carbon markets are not instead, but on top of deep decarbonization. A lot of NGOs criticize these markets because they say, well, that's a distraction from deep decarbonization. And that's not the point. Carbon markets are a tool on top of deep decarbonization on a net zero uh, pathway. That's very important. It's not instead, it's on top. And then of course, as Jan Willem already mentioned, very important, markets must be well designed. The fact that some price levels crash to zero, that's not the problem of the market per se. That's the problem of bad design of too low ambition. So we have to make sure that once we do these markets, we have the ambition levels right, no loopholes, and of course, no double counting. But if we get those parameters right, and it's all there, we have to experience. Uh, carb markets are a tool, as again, as Jan Wilmer said, which bring emissions down in the most cost-effective way. Perhaps I, I leave it there and leave space for discussing these points further later on on the panel. Thank you so much, Renat, for your for your comments. Uh, some of the things I picked up here was an emphasis on, on transparency, uh, an emphasis on using what's already there. Uh, essentially, if it's not completely broken, don't spend too much time fixing it, but just build better. 
um, and, and carbon markets being complementary to, to, as you say, decarbonization and not, not uh, instead of that. Um, moving next to um, uh, an, an area that's uh, probably of particular interest to GCF as well in terms of uh, using market me mechanisms to finance underserved areas of, of climate finance. So a significant amount of climate financing, especially from the private sector, has been flowing into relatively more mainstream areas of technology and intervention, such as utility scale renewables. Um, uh, conversely, there is a sustained shortfall of funding for other highly critical areas of climate change mitigation, including decarbonization of the global transport sector, as well as a variety of nature-based solutions involving forests, agriculture, and oceans, with this shortfall even more pronounced in relation to climate adaptation financing. So if I can turn to you, Scobie, as someone working at the forefront of global carbon markets, uh, what are your thoughts on potential ways that market-based mechanisms could help scale up private sector funding for these more underserved areas of climate finance? perhaps particularly illustrating by reference to some of the projects and initiatives that Macquarie is actively engaged in currently. Over to you, Scopey. Thanks very much. And, and thanks everyone for your time and, and privilege to be on the panel to, to discuss these things. Um, just a very quick intro, uh, uh, maybe uh, it's not required, but uh, Macquarie is an Australian headquartered financial institution. Uh, we, we um, uh, a large renewables player. We're, we're the number one renewables advisor globally at the moment. We have about 46 gigawatts of renewable energy assets, either um, currently under operation or, or, or development. Um, and, and we have quite a large global commodities business as well. Uh, and, and we have been in emissions markets for, for around a decade and a half uh, across, across, um, across the globe. Um, I think um, I, I might break uh, the response in, in, into a couple of parts on this because I think I think um, you, you know you mentioned a few different aspects there transport um, uh, nature-based solutions and, 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 and potentially um, adaptation and resilience um, maybe just turning something to something first that, that I'm closest to personally which you which is the the offset market as it relates to nature-based solutions so I think um, <coughs> in in relation to, to, to sort of driving finance into, into nature-based solutions and, and potentially other high quality offset projects um, like clean cooking, uh, et cetera. Um, I, I would sort of say there's, there's a multitude of things that, that can be improved on, but to our mind, there's probably, probably can be bucketed down into five, which I'd like to touch on. So what, one is narrative and buy-in. Um, uh, the second is risk protection mechanisms. The third is standardization. Four, fourth is in interoperability of markets, and, and the fifth is making sure that we're taking learning from other sectors. Um, in terms of the narrative and buy-in, I think I think we've touched on this, and I think I think I, I, I fully um, echo what Renaud had to say about about the quality of markets. Uh, I think we really need to move past this sort of really tired dialogue about the quality of carbon offset projects. It, it, it's, it, you know, the, the, the industry as a whole has put a massive amount of work into building robustness of methodologies. And yet we still find, and I'm sure Renault and others in the market still find this, that, that amongst corporate buyers, because of this um, uh, fear of, of mostly, mostly media driven skepticism of the market, there is a real reticence um, still amongst a lot of corporates to use offsetting. And we can talk about market mechanisms all we want, but markets don't exist without buyers fundamentally, right? So what's the fundamental problem facing these markets and, 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 and stifling in investment into them generally? It's, it's a lack of critical mass of buyers. And so what we really need to do as a collective is kill that negative rhetoric and kind of get real as to where we are in the climate crisis and the journey. We have to pull every lever available. And, you know, the science is showing more and more that high quality offsetting projects are going to be one of the critical levers that we collectively need to pull to get to a Paris aligned two degree or less climate outcome. It's, 
is that simple. And you know, there's some interesting statistics around around you know nature-based solutions contributing up to thirty percent of, of of that net net contribution to to that outcome. Um, I think the other thing that we need to do is to um, in the same bucket is to really get the order right. I think that uh, Renat Renat to touch on this as well, but you hear this rhetoric about, or, or you know, clients because of the, the paralysis of, of, due to fear of, of how the media will, will react to offsetting use. They talk about rollout of long-term capex reduction projects, um, you know, technology-driven projects that are inherently decade or decade-plus initiatives, and then using offsetting as an afterthought. And it's the wrong way around. And I think Coursera is a great model for this. You know, if you look at there's some very clear visuals that that Akal has, has published, which really show a very sensible way to use offsetting, which is as a bridge to more structural decarbonisation. And I think collectively we need to sort of um, uh, recognise that, and it ties in dovetails directly to what Jan Willem and, and Renaud say were saying about this being the lowest cost, most economical tool that we have available. One one of the most economical tools we have available. Um, and I think, I think you know, again, it, it's not a market mechanism as such, but really this sort of philosophical buy-in to using offsets as a wholesale tool to get us where we need to be um, is really fundamentally what we need to do collectively. And I think part of that, we, we just need to remember the genius really underpinning some of the, this market design, which was these are fundamentally equitable transition tools. When we talk about the climate transition, if you look at the quality of some of these projects that are going on around the world, they really are ways to bring the least um, privileged people in the world along in that journey to create revenue streams out of natural capital assets that, are, that, that empower people to you know, have a living protecting a forest instead of cutting it down. And I, and I think that that's in the current dialogue, particularly in the developed world dialogue, um, we, we you know that's uh, that that tends to get overlooked, and we shouldn't we shouldn't forget it. Um, moving on to the next point, I think you know fundamental to the market, fundamental to bringing more people into the market is price protection and, and de-risking. And so we're working on a, on some initiatives. Um, uh, you know we're in discussion, privileged to be in discussion with with, with GCF and, and others around around initiatives um, to do with price protection and de-risking of, of market activity. Um, there, there are good examples of this having been used very effectively in, in other markets. So as an example, I think you know, the, the UK government has used the contract for difference scheme to promote um, investment into uh, renewable energy assets quite effectively as, as a way of underpinning uh, you know, de-risking uh, project developers, providing stable, predictable cash flow uh, over over a longer term in order to drive capital into into the sector, and and this sort of um, that sort of mechanism is interesting for two reasons. One, it's potentially a very capital efficient way for concessional capital providers to de-risk the sector, rather than providing dollar for dollar grants into projects. They can actually provide market-based mechanisms like contracts for difference that require a fraction of the capital. Um, you know, you have, to, you have to work out how to model it, but potentially provide a, require a fraction of the capital that a direct loan or a grant would, would, would take. And, and therefore they, they enable leverage essentially of concessional capital as a de-risking tool. I think the other, the other interesting point is, you know, for, for actors like, like GCF and, and others with concessional capital to deploy as a, as a way of stimulating the market, what I think we need to do is move away from tools that the private sector doesn't recognise and isn't familiar with. So when you talk to people in the private sector about grants, they don't really understand it. it does, it's not the language that the private sector speaks. If we move towards more market, more mechanisms that the market is more familiar with, like is the based derivative instruments for de-risking, for example, that's something that will in itself drive in market participants and, and create interest in the market. And I think that there's, there's, there's work that can be done uh, around that. Um, 
the other thing that I think there is space for, and there, there are some, there are some uh, good examples of how this has been used in California to deal with, um, to deal with uh, de-risking of California carbon allowance market for actors there. But it, there is need for private sector insurance and, and other de-risking mechanisms to take risk out of projects, for example. So when we talk about the intersection of Article 6 and, and, and the voluntary market, if you strip that back and look at it from a resource law, resource finance perspective, some of the dialogue essentially is around expropriation uh, type, uh, type risks, i.e. as a project developer, because of double counting concerns, am I going to get exposed to someone claiming that I don't have the right to use, sell, retire my, my offsets? And I think that there is space for the private sector to come in while you know, countries get their act together with Article 6 and, and make the rules clear to come in and de-risk some of that um, in a classical sort of a political risk insurance type, type, type sense. And, and, that, and that would help people to, to drive capital into the space. I think um, thirdly, we need, um, market-like contractual structures that, that people are familiar with. So as an example of something we're working on, um, we, we, we took a, a, an investment stake in uh, expansive CBL markets earlier this year. They're a, the only existing um, uh, spot exchange for, for uh, voluntary carbon in the world. Um, recently, they would launched a global emissions offset contract, which is a standardised Corsair compliant contract for, for, for offsets. And we, we were able to um, be the first to transact that recently in the last few weeks. I think things like this, and, and I think the, the, the work that's going on in, 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 the, in the Mark Carney task force, which is centering largely around, I think, the design of standardized base contracts for, uh, for the market will go a long way to driving uh, market entrance. And I think, I think there is a, a real opportunity there just to create simplicity because because of the sort of um, fragmented nature of the market it, it can be quite complex for buyers and participants to come and transact in the market and, and therefore to drive capital through the market and I think the more simple we can make that by standardization uh, the better I think the important point to note there is that's not intended to create a race to the bottom and I think the idea is to create a baseline contract over which a premium can be paid for offset projects, for example, that have compelling sustainable development goal co-benefits or biodiversity co-benefits. And I think we are starting to see the emergence of that sort of market where, um, where we can trade at a difference to a, be to a, be to a, to a benchmark. And we, we hope that the GEO contract um, and, and the work that's being done by the market kind of task force will aid in that, in that sort of critical piece of the market. Um, design. I think um, we, we also, the next point is we need to ensure interoperability of, of, of markets. And this goes to the point around, you know, we now have uh, 61 uh, countries globally that have a carbon pricing mechanism uh, either in place or, or, or planned. Um, as you mentioned, Andreas, about half of those approximately a carbon tax and half a cap and trade or some sort of related scheme. As, as more and more of these um, domestic or regional compliance mechanisms evolve, in order to have a really dynamic and vibrant international emissions market where we're collectively putting capital where it should be and allocating it efficiently and driving positive climate uh, change, we need to make sure that these that all those schemes are interoperable to the maximum extent possible with the voluntary market. And I think, you know, back to Renault's uh, point around the CDM, unfortunately, the CDM, because of some bad actors in the past, was largely discredited and the interoperability of, of that with, with the European market was, was, was cut off. And I think we need to learn from that, but, but not shy away from those interoperability mechanisms, because I think they are really critical to creating a genuinely dynamic market. And let's face it, it's a global problem. It's not a domestic or regional problem. This is a global problem we're facing. We need a, a global market. And so I think, I, think, I think that that's an important point. I think you know, there's some really interesting work 
going on already. I mean, there are interesting markets around. Korea is a, is a notable one. Um, you know, the trade, a lot of traders are interested in that market because of the potential arbitrage opportunities for importing CDM uh, units and nationalizing them into, into the Korean market. I think, um, you know, there are other examples emerging um, that, that potentially present those opportunities. The California Air Resources Board just earlier this uh, week, um, their task force uh, released some interesting recommendations on the forward-looking evolution of the Californian offset market, which is a subset of the Californian cap and trade market. And um, that they've, they've, you know, some of the some of, some of them are quite interesting. So one of them is that they've suggested that 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 California should apply to the International Civil Aviation Organization for inclusion of the Californian uh, offset units uh, as eligible units for the purposes of Corsia, which would create a really interesting path to interoperability there. I think um, they're also seeking in, uh, more linkages with other states like New York, as New York's thinking around around this evolves. And 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 they're, and then lastly, they're, they're, they're moving forward towards being able to use offsets um, as part of the state's own uh, net net zero by 2045 goal. And I think that that's a, I mean, along with Europe, along with the European market, the California market really is leading the way in terms of how they think about market mechanisms. And I think that that's an interesting space to watch. And then lastly, uh, on, on offsets, I think we, should, we, we need to learn from what's been done in other resource sectors. I think that there's a particularly when it comes to Article 6 discussions and, and, you know, and, and double counting technicalities and everything, there's a, there's a bit of a, a tendency within the market to be very insular and inward looking. And, you know, I think if we, if we zoom out a bit and, and look at successful models for resource um, um, extraction and use uh, in other commodity verticals, there is a lot of, there's a lot of law, there are a lot of um, structured finance tools, there, there, are, there are a lot of practices and body of knowledge that's been built up over a, a large number of decades that I don't think we're pulling on um, efficiently at the moment. And I think that there is an inability to accelerate the development of the market by importing some of those mechanisms. Um, and that's what, something we need to do. Without taking up too much time, I'll, I'll, I'll talk very briefly about transport, which you, you, you flagged. I think Again, just taking it, I sit in Houston, so just uh, without wanting to be too US centric, I think, I think California has another interesting example of how market-based mechanisms can be used for transport decarbonization. I think the low carbon fuel standard uh, in, in California is a really interesting example and is probably one of the, and certainly in the US is one of the driving forces for investment in, in, uh, in advanced fuels and um, low carbon fuels projects. Um, the LCFS, for people that don't know about it, is basically a carbon intensity indexed, index based market mechanism where if you, uh, the, carbon, the allowed carbon intensity or, or benchmark carbon intensity of fuels ratchets down over time. If you um, produce a fuel that has a carbon intensity higher than that benchmark, you're in deficit. If you produce a, a fuel that has a lower carbon intensity than that benchmark, you, you're, you're in credit and you, you get a LCFS credit that, that trades in the market. And those credits are trading up around $200 a unit, which is, you know, extremely valuable. Uh, there, there, is, there is definitely, and that uh, is driving interest. Now, there's a, there's a role for the private sector to play there because while that market is interesting, it's also quite cumbersome and hard to access. And so what we're trying to do is design structured notes and other products that give private actors the ability to access those markets, uh, access the, the carbon price risk, if you will, um, and for, for, for a yield. And at the same time, on the other side, uh, allow that, that, that investment appetite to de-risk people that are trying to stand up projects by providing, for example, medium to long-term uh, price floor mechanisms. And I think that there's a, real, there's a real opportunity in that sense. There's a growing appetite in the investor market um, to deploy capital into a positive uh, carbon correlated investment classes, investment assets. And that can be harnessed um, through sensible structuring to provide de-risking, which will in turn spur the market. And I think, I think the California market is an interesting place to watch in that regard. 
I didn't Thank speak you. about I didn't speak about uh, adaptation and resilience, but I think I've probably used my my share of time. So. Thank you very much, Scopey, for for a, a wide variety of very insightful uh, observations. Uh, working obviously uh, very much at the forefront of of carbon markets and, and trying to implement projects. So thank you for that. Um, Moving on to um, the next question, which is really linking market mechanisms to to support a green and resilient recovery. And if I could turn to Margaret Ann for this, um, how do you see the potential role of carbon pricing mechanisms in the context of implementing a green and resilient recovery? And what practical measures can or should governments, regulators, and other key stakeholders take to incorporate carbon pricing mechanisms into GRR efforts, including in terms of further scaling up private sector financing. Thank you, Marika. Thank you, Andreas. It's great to be here today with you and familiar colleagues um, on this panel. And I'd like to thank the audience uh, across the globe for joining us uh, for the session. Um, in response to your questions, Andreas, I've got three points to make. These will be around the efficiency and effectiveness of market mechanisms, how they can be implemented in a green and resilient economy, and that these are, in fact, revenue generators. So you want them in your climate policy toolkit. Um, so first of all, as I mentioned, carbon pricing mechanisms can create efficiency and effectiveness. Markets have the potential to catalyze high integrity, science aligned climate action and markets based approach is efficient as it allows for the allocation of capital towards lowest cost intervention. Saying that, the global context has to be taken into account and for countries to build back better from the COVID-19 crisis, they must align their concern for a rapid economic recovery with their strategic policy objectives. Sustainable recovery is possible and can deliver economic growth and jobs while reducing CO2 emissions and meeting the sustainable development goals. But that requires robust climate policy um, to promote short-term economic recovery, as well as the long-term energy transition. Carbon pricing mechanisms uh, help guide immediate investment and spending decisions with regards to long -term, uh, the long-term in mind. So they're also, as we've seen uh, in the case of the EU emissions trading scheme, resilient and flexible in the face of external shocks, such as those induced by COVID-19. When they are properly designed rules for the operation of market mechanisms, they provide economic and environmental integrity uh, and signal to businesses and governments that any trades undertaken in accordance with the system can, will be valid and of value. However, while carbon can be uh, traded as a commodity, we can't expect these markets to regulate themselves. The design of market matters a lot, as Renette and Jan Willem and, and also Scobie mentioned. Um, as we've seen market failures in the past, and we've learned that sometimes the invisible hand isn't necessarily the, the best regulator. Um, so key elements to the success of such a system need to include measurement, transparency, accountability, fungibility, and consistency. Carbon pricing in particular is a useful tool to guide investment decisions, especially those that will have long-term impacts on future emissions and can complement stimulus packages focusing on short-term recovery. Now, now, secondly, with regards to a green and resilient economy, um, stimulus measures can help clean energy technologies compete with carbon intensive alternatives and encourage more energy efficient, efficient energy use. While support measures to reduce cost and enhance performance may be launched under recovery funds, these will require longer term investment certainty. And, and I can't stress this enough to governments and policymakers that policy has to be long, loud, and lasting for the private sector to participate. One such way to do so would be to have a progressively increasing carbon price alongside stimulus packages, as this would provide essential confidence for investment um, in long-lived, uh, low carbon infrastructure and research uh, development and also demonstration of clean energy technology. Furthermore, um, developing important decarbonization technologies such as carbon capture, utilization and storage, um, along with hydrogen, relies on long term policy, policies such as carbon price signals. However, concerns around um, affordability and manufacturing cost competitiveness may delay development of carbon markets. 
Be because many of these technologies just don't have the business case yet. Um, they are simply not bankable without support or funding. And what we are seeing is almost a, a, a two-speed decarbonization process. Um, with fiscal and monetary stimulus accelerating clean tech investments already at scale. Um, just consider renewables, they are already now competitive with fossil fuels. On the other hand, nascent uh, sequestration technologies with carbon pricing as the main revenue line struggles. So the, the voluntary credit markets can fill in some of the policy gaps, particularly in, uh, in nature-based solutions. But ultimately, carbon pricing is, is necessary to foster broad clean tech innovation and achieve cost efficient net zero carbon. And my third point is that explicit and effective carbon pricing schemes can raise significant revenues. You talked about these 61 different carbon taxes and schemes and governments raised more than $45 billion from carbon pricing in 2019. Now these revenues can be redistributed to protect the poor and those vulnerable to the effects of the transition easing the political feasibility and justice of the transition. Carbon revenues can also be used to boost investment in sustainable infrastructure and public goods, such as um, education and health and social safety nets. While carbon pricing has been criticized for, as inequitable, this is not the case if it is complemented by appropriate revenue recycling. In fact, if you think about it, no other instrument generates revenues for compensation. To compare, uh, uh, you know, uh, adoption subsidies for rooftop solar and electric vehicles even use up money and are inequitable by, or can be inequitable by going to, to well-off households. So the focus on revenue raising potential of carbon pricing and its potential for use uh, in, in, for broader social objectives is key, is a key one that policymakers can use to get buy-in. And there is research building the case that the gap between the actual carbon prices and those required to achieve ambitious climate change mitigation could be closed by enhancing the public acceptability of carbon pricing through appropriate use of revenues raised. Uh, you know, adding on to what Scoby mentioned about this, there's, um, uh, it's a perception in the market um, that I think we all need to work very hard on to, to change that. And I'll leave that at there. Thank you so much, Andreas. Thank you very much, uh, Margaret Ann, for those uh, observations. Uh, long, loud and lasting, I think, should be a plea to all governments in relation to policy. And then the emphasis on, on the revenue raising potential, uh, as you mentioned, is, is very an important aspect as well. Um, if we could quickly turn to, um, to the next question, which is uh, around compliance versus voluntary markets in a carbon markets context, uh, and what is really going to drive change. So. Um, the current state of the global carbon market is characterized by a certain degree of fragmentation in terms of modalities for implementation, um, geographical and sexual coverage, etc. Um, with current mechanisms spanning both large scale compliance based systems such as EU ETS and Corsia, as well as a number of voluntary based platforms. Um, whilst compliance markets may offer a larger scale of intervention, Complexities around their design may also lead to delays in implementation or scaling up. Uh, conversely, voluntary schemes may operate in a less complex manner, but often lack significant scale potential. Um, Renard, if I could briefly turn to you uh, as someone with a, a long-standing involvement in this space, particularly around the voluntary carbon markets, how do you see these different market segments interacting in the context of the needs to rapidly scale up action on climate change? Sure. Um, thanks, um, Andreas. I guess I start with a point that just builds quickly on what Margaret Ann and Scooby said around the 61 fragmented markets. Let's be very clear. It would very obviously be much better if we had one global market. And we had that to a certain degree back in the Kyoto days with one Kyoto protocol, one annex to and a, a clean development mechanism, which essentially was the rules for for everybody. But we have to face reality. Paris has departed from this logic. And I, I guess you all know what the reason behind this is. The fundamental reason was that ultimately Kyoto Protocol was only binding the OECD countries more or less. And many of the players in those countries found it's no longer fair if big new players like China and India are not bound. And essentially that's the core reason why Paris departed from this 
one global framework and embarked on a more decentralized market. So I think that's simply what we have. And I'm completely with all of you that we have to, and I made this point before, fungibility is very important. But let me make one point. Even if it's a fragmented market, it's still interesting. Because, for example, at South Pole, we are advising companies on TCFD and we're calculating climate risks. And what we can do now is we can model the performance of your assets in a world where global current pricing is $5, $10, $50, $100, $500. It's all models that show you how your assets perform. And global boards take this more and more serious. So in the end of the day, if as let's say the CEO of Mars or the CEO of Cargill or whoever, you are running your, your, your scenarios, you ultimately don't care whether you have a carbon tax, an emission trade scheme, a subsidy scheme, whatever, one way or the other, carbon has a price. That is ultimately the important message to boards when they take their decisions regarding long-term infrastructure programs. So I think, you know, I just want to, to, to highlight a, a positive note, even the fragmented markets are much better than nothing at all. So having said all that, yes, traditionally there has been a big division between voluntary and compliance. Compliance markets were essentially <coughs> off tech was always the EU ETS. Um, voluntary market was mostly for companies who wanted to voluntarily um, get into climate action. Now, today, the lines are more blurred because we still have the classic voluntary markets. We still have classic compliance markets where I think Margaret mentioned Korea, uh, we have Colombia, we have other places. But now there is a new space of what I would call pre-compliance. We find large companies who currently don't have to buy carbon, but who are nonetheless deciding to get exposure in anticipation of potential rules that could come through in the future. So currently we have this, it's actually even more complex. We don't have voluntary compliance. We have a pre-compliance game as well. Still, it, 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 does, it is important that it's the, this fragmentation is an explanation, and I had I heard this point before, why we have different price levels. Many people complain that we need a global exchange. It doesn't make sense with all these price levels. But actually, these price levels are a function of different goals to achieve. Compliance markets typically look for the cheapest abatement costs. So whatever the cheapest ton is, that's the ton, that's the certificates I'm going to get. Voluntary climate action can attach much more topics other than climate. For example, a cookstove program in Ghana, which we're rolling out, brings a ton of benefits like health benefits community benefits, but I cannot possibly run a cookstove program in Ghana at the price of two, three dollars a ton. It just don't work. I need at least eight to ten dollars for that. And guess what? People are pay willing to pay that price because they know this ton comes from a Ghana cookstove program and not from any uh, random uh, program. So I think at the moment, there, it is a reality that we have different price levels because we have different players who are in this market for different purposes. And I think that I don't see this changing anytime very soon, even if, of course, personally, I hope that we can more and more move to fungibility and to more global schemes. Because very obviously, if you really want scale, we, we need to um, be able to, to embark on, on bigger structures. But I think that's currently the reality. There is different markets because there is a variety of players in it, in them. Thank you very much, uh, Renat. Um, maybe, maybe Scobie, if I could quickly put the same question to you around compliance versus voluntary markets. Um, with a particular interest in hearing your views on the prospects for potentially very ambitious schemes such as Corsia, being able to drive a step up in private sector financing for carbon markets. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think, um, so I think we see over time the convergence of compliance and voluntary markets. I, I agree with Renaud, I think it's going to take time and I think there is a bifurcation in the market at the moment, really um, it's becoming more pronounced between uh, people that want a standardised unit like a GEO, like a, a Corsia compliant uh, standard unit and then there are principle driven 
large emitters that want to uh, have a decisive role in t additionality, let's say, and they are looking to have direct engagement with high quality projects, book stores, nature-based solutions, blue carbon, uh, et cetera. And I, so I, I agree wholeheartedly with that principle that there is there are different actors in the market and they want different things. And I think that that will persist for some time. I think we, we see, we see Corsair as as a as a a really interesting paradigm. I think it's 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 it was a massive achievement. It's been criticised, you know, the front and centre. But if you step back and look at what it's done, it's an acknowledgement by one of the largest emitting sectors or the in the world that offsets need to be used as a bridge to structural decarbonisation. There is no way you are going to fundamentally decarbonise air travel in the immediate future. We have to bridge into the scaling out of sustainable aviation fuel production assets, the scaling and, and development of alternate um, fuels that are feasible for shorter haul uh, flights and so on. And I think that that acknowledgement and, and the order in which Corsair lays out the use of offsets is, is really fundamentally important. And, you know, <laughs> Tragically, um, one, of the tra one of the tragedies of COVID, one of the victims of COVID has been um, the, the ramping up of activity on the back of, of, uh, of Corsia. But we think that's temporary and we definitely see it as being a, a real, as I said, a paradigm for what we think should be rolled out elsewhere. And there are other sectors that, you know, you should be should be looking at that sort of approach. So shipping is one, and I, you know, and, and the South Pole team are quite engaged in that, and and we we see that as being another one, and there are a variety of other examples. And so, uh, we think that again, and I, and I point I point back briefly to the, the point around um, the California regulator looking at interoperability between Corsair and the California market. I think that the more of these sorts of industry specific schemes or outcome specific schemes that we can drive as let's let's call them quasi compliance schemes um and drive those into creating a more a more holistic demand center because again really markets don't exist without buyers and and that's what Corsair does is, is it creates a grip of of motivated buyers that have to comply or, or are driven to comply with, with targets set under Corsair um, the more of those we can have, the more dynamic the market will be. And so we, we, we think there's, you know, there's a real need and opportunity to, to sort of follow in the footsteps of, of, what, of what Corsair is, is aiming to achieve. And we think that it will be successful, you know, at post, post sort of COVID. Um, um, we have, you know, when we think about voluntary and, and compliance markets, I, I think one thing that, that uh, the Article 6 process has shown is that states have proven themselves, maybe not surprisingly, to be less nimble actors in this space than the, than, than, than the private sector. And so I think we're, we're involved in a lot of discussions around Article 6 and, 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 and we, my personal view is a lot of that noise inhibits action. And what we, our view is that you need to separate two things. Nationally determined contributions under the Paris Accord are a governmental problem. They need, governments need to work out how they're going to set those ambitions and comply with them and, and, and work out how to have government government arrangements to deal with, with those rules. In the meantime, what they need to do is work out how to get out of the way so that private, the private sector can get on with setting ambitious targets um, well out ahead of, of, of governments and really driving capital into, into meaningful projects around the world to, to decarbonise. And I think, I think there's still a real, a real conflation in the dialogue um, between Article 6 and the voluntary market, and, and it needs to be killed. And I think, I think it comes back to an earlier point I was trying to make, which is around looking at other resource sectors and, and looking at government to private sector agreements like direct agreements or royalty agreements that have been used in other sectors that just create a very strong, clear contractual right for private sector to get on with their projects. And 
expressly state that any double counting or any other issue associated with the, the Paris uh, Agreement level um, arrangement is for the state to sort out. And it doesn't affect the validity of the contractual rights and obligations of private actors as, as it pertains to the offset projects and, and buyers of, of offsets, et cetera. So I think that that's a important, it's an important thing that we need to do is, is, is sort of extricate the, the, part, the Article 6 debate from the, the voluntary sector and let, and, and, uh, and let the private sector get on with doing what they're trying to do uh, and doing more in, in, in the voluntary market. Um, having said all that, I think that there is some really interesting stuff emerging um, with, again, it's a kind of an interoperability point, but with potential um, private sector to, to sovereign deals at, in, in a pre article six world. And I think the Swiss are, are, are sort of showing some real leadership in this space as are, as are others. I think the, the, the announcement earlier this week of, of the um, Switzerland-Peru um, bilateral agreement to foster investment in, 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 um, in climate positive projects is, is a really interesting first step. I think that hopefully that sort of um, arrangements materialise uh, in a way that doesn't try to insert the government sector into projects, but instead create a framework that enables the private sector to pump capital in and to create a dynamic market under those those bilateral agreements. And I, you know, I think we really applaud that sort of forward thinking work by Switzerland and, and Peru in that regard. Um, one other point, conscious of time, but I think it's an important point is when, when we think about compliance and voluntary markets, in particular when we're talking between the private and the public sectors, I think it's an important thing to think about is grandfathering of, of ambition. So if I'm a private sector uh, corporate with a, with, a, with a significant emissions footprint and I'm, look, I'm considering buying a 10-year forward contract uh, for volumes of offsets from a project, I need comfort that the, my regulator is not going to turn around in five years and say, those offsets are not eligible for the new carbon tax or new cap and trade scheme that I'm introducing. And I've just, I've, I've sunk that capital. We need, to, we need to collectively ensure that the private sector is being rewarded for, for, forward, for leaning forward and, and taking action now. And so I think that really important to, to, that we work together to give investors and actors comfort that they're not going to be um, uh, you know, put at a disadvantage by, by later introduction of, of cap and trade schemes or carbon tax schemes. And I think that that grandfathering is quite an important thing for us all to think about. Thank you so much, Kirby, for, for a very, uh, very good insight. Um, lastly, if we can briefly turn to um, sort of pulling all of these different themes and strands together into how GCF can be relevant in this context. Um, as people will be aware, GCF has a, a, a mission that has a focus on, on driving our collective response to climate change through catalyzing funding at scale from both public and private sources. Um, particularly from your vantage point, Margaret Ann, as, as an active private sector observer to the GCF board, what do you see as the most relevant and impactful ways in which GCF can, can support this aim? including in terms of what types of interventions and structures could be relevant for GCF to support um, in, terms of, in terms of carbon markets. Thanks, Andreas. Um, and let me start by sharing uh, the role of an, uh, of an observer as some people in the audience might be aware of this position, but others might not know. So the GCF is mandated to grant accredited observers uh, access to its meetings. My uh, organization, the Nonprofit Climate Markets and Investment Association, is an accredited observer um, to the GCF, and we are a membership organization comprised of private sector companies with a mission to stimulate a shift in the direction and scale of private and public financial flows into investments which are consistent with the objectives of the Paris Agreement. Um, there are currently 83 private sector organizations accredited at the GCF uh, and 296 civil society organizations. Uh, to this end, there are four um, observers uh, that are able to participate in board sessions, 
two representatives from civil society and two from the private sector. Um, there's one observer from uh, both developed and developing countries, and I represent, as you mentioned at the very start, the developed nations constituency. Now, selected observers uh, have the opportunity to guide and share input on uh, global climate finance decisions. We serve as a conduit between our constituency and the GCF, promoting transparency and enabling stronger, more effective um, uh, share input and pro on project design and implementation outcomes. Thus, I speak with um, and gain insight with a variety of private sector actors uh, engaged with the fund from accredited entities who are already developing projects with the GCF uh, to uh, those that are um, have proposals in the pipeline. Um, Questions are like, you know, what are the barriers and bottlenecks? Um, what, uh, what can be done to find solutions to unlock more private sector finance in GCF activities? These are, these are the types of questions that I'm asking and together um, with my private sector constituents and, and the fund and the secretary, we look for solutions that are workable, bankable and scalable. Thus, your question uh, of vantage point as an active observer is interesting in order um, and, and in order to provide answers to the most relevant and impactful ways that the GCF can support the same of catalyzing carbon market mechanisms. Let's just first consider the structure of the fund, um, how it operates and their investment criteria. Because the GCF's two primary track metrics for their projects and their pipeline are one, anticipated number of people with increased resiliency and two, anticipated tons of CO2 equivalent avoided. And as I discussed previously, carbon markets are about efficiency and effectiveness for reducing emissions. Then if we consider the GCF's investment criteria, they really look for impact potential and paradigm shifting potential. Now this idea of, of paradigm shift is really crucial. It's the core of what the GCF is trying to achieve. Paradigm shift is all about trying to catalyze transformational change. So while some entrepreneurs or initiatives might want to roll out a particular, let's say a particular technology, a project that is designed to bring about a paradigm shift has market transformation or systematic change in mind. Hence the logical pathway uh, of reasoning is that the GCF has the potential to assist carbon market developments because they can be transformational. We've seen this from the example of just the CDM. Um, however, there is no formal GCF policy on carbon markets, nor an official stance. And the board is mixed as evidenced at the last board meeting when there was a division of perspectives from board members um, on the EBRD high impact program for the corporate sector funding proposal. So the ability to utilize carbon markets during the construction phase of EBRD's proposal wasn't the only board issue, uh, wasn't the only issue that the board members had, okay? But it certainly got a lot of airtime. Uh, at the board meeting. Now, developed country board members were supportive of the use of carbon markets, developing country board members less so, and it finally got approved, albeit a bit begrudgingly, on the final day. But what we see as the private sector it, it, is an implicit opportunity for the GCF to, to establish projects in the face of the recession and pandemic that actually supports carbon market developments as they did by approving the EBRD project which spans over seven countries. The GCF can be used to deploy technologies and uh, facilitate respective investments to enable regulatory environments, um, but their reach and influence can also extend to carbon pricing. Now, for the most part, uh, industries in the EBRD countries don't really understand the carbon pricing thing, but we know that carbon pricing is on the horizon in most developing countries. However, many of these industrial um, sectors in these developing countries um, are simply not anticipating or adequately preparing for it. So not only can the GCF um, uh, projects provide concessional finance for low carbon investments, they can also provide technical assistance and capacity building for carbon pricing. This project was the first of its kind in the GCF pipeline, and we see this program as replicable, replicable hence scalable for other, um, other countries. And building on this premise, this, my last point is, is, is really just when you consider the three distinct features of the GCF, uh, which are a balanced portfolio, uh, country ownership, and unlocking private finance, the, the non, the, this notion of country ownership is to ensure that GCF activities are in harmony 
with the national priorities. And developing countries can use carbon pricing as a policy tool. Um, and uh, a lot of countries that the GCF works with have not yet implemented carbon pricing. So since we know that these carbon pricing initiatives are growing, um, and this represents an opportunity to establish a market resiliency of GCF investments in their mitigation projects. This could be structured as capacity building um, activities and or maybe technical assistance around creating national policies on carbon pricing. Um, or, or it really could be incorporated in, into larger programmatic uh, funding proposals which are looking to create um, carbon funds. In any case, we'd certainly like uh, welcome uh, more projects in the GCF pipeline that incorporate the use of carbon markets and or have carbon pricing embedded in it. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Margaret. And just quickly, um, Jan Willem, if I can turn to you as well on the same question. Uh, as someone obviously closely familiar with GCF from an accredited entity perspective, um, what are your thoughts on the, on the potential role that GCF might be able to play as a catalyst within this space? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andreas, and uh, also thank you, Margaret, and you took away half of my points. Um, but um, no, I, I think the, the, let's say the GCF plays, of course, a key role in this uh, transformational change story that we need to de deploy uh, also in the developing countries. Um, and I'm going to say something challenging, but in my view, the, the carbon transactions are almost like the purest form of climate finance, uh, because it's money going towards uh, reductions. Um, but yeah, it's carbon markets is a, is a systematic measure that's often sector-wide or economy-wide, but it's not easy to do. Uh, if you see the carbon markets that are there in the world, uh, it takes time to, to kind of set it up uh, and get to play. Uh, there's MOV accounting, buyers and sellers need the marketplace, and importantly, and Margaret was also uh, linking that, uh, it needs to link up to the long-term strategies and the NDCs of the countries. But I think the more countries pay attention to also domestic carbon pricing schemes, and I include that tax and hybrid schemes as well, uh, the easier it also will be then to link it up in, in an international market as may, may come to play under Article 6 and and other international markets like uh, like Russia. Um, so not easy, but I think where it works and uh, and again well designed, it's a very effective measure and it leverages the private sector at scale. So I, I think when so we try when designing these programs with the GCF and and the countries we work in. Um, we, we try to combine let's say, incentives for the project sponsors that, that want to move uh, uh, on, this, uh, on the climate agenda together uh, with regulatory reform in the countries, capacity building, uh, and also with let's say, local institutions trading, uh, uh, let's say, exchanges for, for market, uh, for cover markets, uh, etc. As EBD, we started doing this in Kazakhstan on the back of the Renewable Energy Framework, which is uh, co-financed by the GCF. And indeed, we included it in the high impact program that, uh, that Margaret then was uh, speaking to. Um, now for this all to really work, we need to make sure that we truly support the early movers. Um, in our discussions uh, with climate funds in general, there's a lot of discussion on optimizing the kind of level of concessionality at the project level. Well, while if we put more energy in optimizing the use of concessionality at the system level, um, I think we can uh, achieve uh, bigger results. Um, also, I, in my view, the, the, the conditions that the climate funds put should not restrict trading, it should foster trading and uh, markets can only operate if uh, if there's supply 
and, and of course demand. Um, so this is um, some area where we need to do some further thinking as to uh, how that can be uh, can be structured. But the key one is that there needs we should not have a competition uh, between climate finance and carbon market uh, mechanisms. It's end end. It's not or. And if we make it like or, then we lose out. It, I think there's also, and that's what very few people understand, that a lot of the funding that comes to the climate funds is generated by carbon markets, like the auctioning of EUAs, for example, under the EU emissions trading scheme. So the more robust we can make the markets, there's a reflow, so to say, or use of proceeds through climate funds that is very important. So I think that link needs to be understood and um, and that will, I think, help the, to understand that a good, robust carbon market is also essential for the climate funds as such. Um, so again, the GCF could help the accredited entities to help create instruments that accelerate climate action and bring supply to market, increase market liquidity. And for example, in an interim period, um, uh, create instruments like this, um, uh, what Kobe said, the uh, contract for differences to, to hedge uh, against price fluctuations in a period where perhaps the local financial market isn't able to take on this uh, hedging role uh, on the carbon price. But it's about establishing the examples and then uh, eventually the, the market will, uh, will come and, uh, and take over some of these important roles. Um, so also, and I, I, we were talking about fiscal uh, scarcity, um, this type of innovative instruments like contract for differences uh, and there are other instruments, carbon price underwriting instruments as well, can help to leverage uh, mm. the, uh, the funds and mobilize the private sector in that. Um, and I think uh, we didn't touch upon this, uh, although I saw some questions in the in the question box. Um, that's I according to the IPCC scenarios, we need to go through negative emissions um, in order to be able to to hit the the one uh, well keep the global warming below the 1.5 degrees. That means um, that's I negative emissions removals, and again. Here, I think uh, a thriving carbon market could eventually switch into a mode that, that such negative uh, emission removals are being promoted. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you, Andres. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan Willem, for, for those insights and setting a bit of a bit of homework for, for GCF to work with with the credit entities and others. Um, so this brings uh, brings us to an end of the of the moderated panel session. And thank you very much to the panelists for 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 their responses. Um, I think we, we're running a little bit over time, but but I've been with the fact that we have about 10 minutes or so for, for, for Q&A. We've received a number of very good questions from the audience. So thank thank you everyone for, for submitting those through Hoover. I think what we'll do is try to take at least maybe two or three of those. Um, and then for the remaining questions, we've made note of that, uh, of those questions, and we will seek to work with our panelists to provide uh, a written feedback on those questions, which will then be available on the Hoover platform for, I understand, up to three months after the event. Um, so maybe if we briefly just uh, take two or three questions, like if I could ask panelists to be very concise, uh, no more than a minute or so in, in responses, that would be appreciated. Um, maybe first, Scobie, um, one question that came in was, in countries like Jamaica, where private interests own large tracts of forest land, how can carbon pricing initiatives be introduced to incentivize contribution to a climate resilient economic recovery? Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think I will keep it brief. I, I, I suppose, <clears throat> you know, one of the one of the geniuses of, of of the carbon market and the nature based solutions subset of that is is turning natural capital assets like forests and and, and other and other areas into into revenue generating assets in and of themselves. I suppose, um, you know, really, I, I think the 
market mechanism is already there. Um, it's a question of showing the environmental additionality. And really, I think it's a, it's a largely technical question about um, can, can the protection or um, restoration of those private sector forest lands in Jamaica um, be, be, be fit within either an existing uh, a methodology or if warranted, a, a new methodology under, under one of the, the international registries. Um, so I, th I think, you know, I think that there are other very good examples of, of, of developing countries, I think Peru, Peru is probably one, but there are plenty of other examples where the government have, has been quite proactive in trying to create a framework that really encourages and enables private sector to, to leverage things like forest holdings um, to, to generate offsets, which are then sold into the international market. And I think developing you know, other countries like Jamaica can probably follow suit. Without knowing anything, to be really honest about, about the, the opportunity in Jamaica itself, I, the, the other emerging subset of the Nature Based Solutions um, sector is, is blue carbon. And I think that we will see increasingly, um, uh, and maybe importantly for, for island states, uh, um, uh, high quality carbon offsets coming out of blue carbon projects. And, and that's probably another, another area worth exploring. I'm um, very happy to take that offline, you know, or to, to provide more written answer. Thanks very much, Scobie. Uh, one more question, maybe, maybe for you, Mark Rodan. Um, the question is, please talk about the convergence, if any, between emission caps, uh, cap and trade schemes and carbon tax, um, how these could coexist and be successful in accelerating a net zero economy transition and the ideal roles for the different stakeholders. So complex questions, perhaps you can, you can tackle some aspects of it. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I'm conscious of time, so I will. So that's a great question actually, because we're seeing this more and more. And um, Renat alluded to that, uh, that you know, before it was very much two separate regimes and now we're seeing this convergence. Uh, let's just take the example of Colombia that has a fuel tax, but you can, um, uh, you could comply with, uh, um, offsets that are actually um, originated in Colombia uh, rather than pay the $5 fuel tax. Uh, South Africa has a um, carbon tax and part of that allows for the um, inclusion of carbon offsets. So this is a, this is, you know, these are, uh, these are carbon tax where it's actually using carbon markets as, as, a, as an instrument um, that the, the governments didn't actually create. These were not, um, uh, let's say allowances in the case of EU ETS. Um, and one thing that I think is re really one last point that I'll, I'll talk about that I'm, I'm seeing and I'm very interested in this is what's happening in America and following on from what Scobie said, but really how they could uh, coexist and be successful in accelerating a net zero economy. There's this, um, the US has this 45Q tax credit um, that, uh, for carbon capture and there's a um, incentive investment in, it's, it's basically a tax credit for incentivizing investment into more expensive markets uh, around carbon uh, sequestration. And it, it's very interesting. They, they came out with the, or they, uh, in May of this year, they came out with more an outline of how this is going to work. And uh, I personally know a lot of people that are looking more and more into carbon sequestration, which they weren't before, and particularly if you're in California, which uh, Scobie talked on with regards to the um, LCFS credits, it's not entirely clear, or, or certainly it hasn't been ruled out that you couldn't, in fact, um, uh, potentially have both of these uh, types of credits stacking on top of one another. And there's a lot of work going on around, you know, what's the best technology, and we're seeing um, investments or, or certainly a, a more interest in investments in, in, into looking at carbon capture and storage than we have been in, in quite a while. So I'll leave it at that. Maybe somebody else wants to say anything, but I'm conscious of time. Thanks. Indeed, thank you very much. Uh, maybe, um, uh, maybe we probably do have to, to bring the session to a close. Um, so uh, I would like to extend a, a very warm note of thank you to our five, uh, uh, sorry, four excellent panelists for, for sharing their, their insights for today's session. And of course, thank you very much to the audience for your, your interest and participation in this session of the conference. 
Um, as I mentioned, we will work with our panelists to provide answers to all of the remaining questions, many of which were, were very, very good. Um, uh, in, in closing, please note that the video recording of this session will be posted on, after the event on the Hoover platform and later on the GCF website as well. Uh, and we invite you to access uh, other sessions, there's only one remaining as far as I know, uh, of the conference and explore the virtual networking features available on Hoover. Uh, you can access the list of participants, uh, create meetings, etc. Uh, on that platform. Uh, we would also like to very much thank the team of interpreters who supported us today. And we invite you to also visit our website at greenclimate.fund forward slash events to learn about this event and other past and upcoming GCF events. And with that, I'd like to say goodbye and stay safe. Thank you.